Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of On Attachment. In today's episode, we're talking all about building a healthy relationship with yourself and more specifically what some of the pillars of a healthy relationship to self are. Now, I've spoken many times on the podcast and elsewhere, if you've been following my work for a while, about this idea of self-love that is touted in a lot of personal development content and circles and how, for me at least, personally, that kind of content has never really resonated. I think at various times in my life, I've tried to pretend that it resonates and I've gotten kind of anthemic about self-love and those nice little quotes and snippets that we might see. Um, But it's never really resonated with me on a deep level because let's face it, self-love, particularly if you treat that as a destination that you're meant to reach, you know, a feeling that you're just meant to have. I think for a lot of us who've struggled with various forms and expressions of insecurity or low self-esteem, just a wobbly kind of relationship with yourself and with others, uh, feeling like self-love is the destination that we're all meant to be striving towards and ultimately reaching, that can feel like a really big mountain to climb. And especially so if you've been told the story that self-love is a prerequisite to you having a healthy relationship or being happy Um, living a life that you can be proud of and enjoy. I think if you're waiting for all of that to happen until you reach this nirvana place of self-love, then that can feel pretty, ironically, it can feel quite defeating and demoralizing because that can feel really far away for a lot of people. And certainly for me, even now, I think I have a pretty healthy relationship with myself. Uh, I don't know that self-love as some sort of destination it doesn't really feel like a label that fits or that really means much to me and so all of that being said and you may have heard me say this before my personal preference is to focus on some other pillars of self things that are a bit more tangible uh, and a little bit more specific a little less abstract and that are more readily translated into actions and practices that we can weave into our everyday in a way that, you know, we bit by bit, we lay down the bricks and we build this foundation of a really solid relationship with ourselves that doesn't have to be, you know, self-love as this big all-consuming feeling, uh, but rather is based on, you know, just kind of a healthy, integrated, realistic uh, relationship with ourselves that then I think allows us to approach relationships with others, whether romantic or otherwise, from a place of integrity and self-confidence and self-esteem and resilience, which I think should really be the goal for most of us. So in today's episode, I'm going to share four of those pillars of self. And this is inspired by or borrowed from the Secure Self Challenge that I'm running, which starts in less than a week. So if you're listening to this uh, around the time that it's released, there's still time to join us. It's a 28-day challenge. Uh, And the four pillars that I'm going to talk about today line up with the four weekly themes that we're going to be diving deep into throughout the challenge. So if you're interested in exploring what I'm talking about today in the format of a challenge, which will have a weekly lesson and then a weekly practice um, or your homework challenge, along with an online community, accountability, a couple of live calls with me, one of which is next week. Um, and having you know that group experience, I would really love to see you inside the Secure Self, all of which is linked in the show notes, or you can find it on my website. And this will be the last opportunity to join because as I said, we kick off next Monday, I believe. Now, I want to start by giving you a permission slip, which kind of runs counter to everything that I'm going to say subsequent to this in the episode. And that is that if you are in this place of feeling really rubbish about yourself, feeling like your self-esteem is in tatters, and maybe you've been trying therapy and podcasts and courses and books and everything, desperately searching for answers and solutions and fixes for why you feel the way you feel. Sometimes the answer isn't 
more searching. (laughs) Sometimes the answer isn't, you know, continuing to seek the one thing that's going to provide you with the explanation that makes it all make sense, that then provides you with the roadmaps that will give you the solution or the remedy that liberates you from feeling the way that you've been feeling. Sometimes the solution is actually in just taking a break from all of that seeking and searching because, and we'll come to this in a moment when we talk about self-compassion. I think that depending on the mindset that you're in, when you come to any kind of self-help, personal development, growth work, it can either be really, really fruitful and a beautiful gift that you give to yourself, or it can reinforce all of the feelings of defectiveness and shame and brokenness and wrongness that you've been lugging around and that have led you to feel that the way that you're feeling. And so I think it's important to practice discernment and to get really honest around is consuming all of this stuff feeling supportive for me at the moment, or am I kind of frantically clutching at straws from this place of urgency and panic and needing to fix myself? Uh, And is that actually helping or is that making me feel even more defeated and hopeless Um, and convinced that there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Uh, So sometimes when we recognize that it's actually not helping uh, and sometimes we need to not take it all so seriously and maybe just step away from it and maybe do something different, give ourselves the time and the space to just be and to accept the process that we're in and the season that we're in uh, without scrambling desperately to get away from it all. Sometimes there's real peace in that letting go um, and yeah, realizing that we don't need to treat ourselves as a problem to be solved and, and actually that doing so can make things worse rather than better. So that feeds nicely into the first pillar of self that I want to talk about, which is self compassion. Again, this is something that I've spoken at great length about, not only on the podcast, but in pretty much all of my programs, because it's completely essential in my mind to the effectiveness of any of this work, that we are turning towards ourselves with self-compassion and curiosity, rather than blaming ourselves, shaming ourselves, um, having a rigid mindset that tells us that we need to urgently fix and change something. So self-compassion is not about coddling ourselves. And I think that's a really important distinction because some people might have an aversion to the idea of self-compassion on the basis of you know, it seeming like we're just removing any accountability or self-responsibility. Uh, we're giving ourselves a bit of a free pass to you know, behave however we want to because we're in pain or we're hurt. And I think particularly people can struggle with this in the context of giving compassion to others, you know, of approaching others with compassion, compassion and curiosity when you've been hurt by them. But it's so important to understand that the compassion is not mutually exclusive with responsibility and certainly not in the way that I'm talking about it or the way that I teach it. I think that balancing self-compassion with self-responsibility is paramount uh, and a really important part of actually making change. Um, But I think as a first step, we need to, rather than spinning around in the stories of why am I like this? What's wrong with me? Why is it so easy for everyone else and so hard for me? Actually going, okay, what's this really about for me? Why does this thing feel scary? Where does that come from? And approaching ourselves with the starting assumption that our experience makes sense and it being our job to figure out why it makes sense. Where does this come from? What do I need? Uh, Because, you know, all of our experiences, all of our patterns, all of our fears, they don't just spontaneously arise in a vacuum. They are the sum of our experiences. Uh, And I think when we really realize that and appreciate that, we can see that it's really a matter of cause and effect um, rather than something very opaque and mysterious and dumbfounding um, that doesn't make any sense and that we need to just try and eradicate. And the more that we can have this mindset and perspective of seeking to understand ourselves from a place of curiosity uh, and from this starting assumption that everything we're struggling with probably makes sense on one level or another, then we can start to actually befriend those parts of ourselves that are afraid or that have these patterns or that drive us to behaviors that we maybe don't like uh, and we can go okay like what purpose is this serving how is it trying to keep me safe Uh, and what do I need 
what else could I do maybe to offer myself a sense of safety or a sense of security or a sense of whatever else I'm needing as such that this extreme behavior or this extreme emotional response doesn't feel so needed anymore. So when we start to kind of zoom out and look at those things in a more spacious way, rather than with this clinging, gripping, rigid, fear-based mentality of needing to solve our uncomfortable experiences and emotions, uh, then all of a sudden a lot of space is freed up for us to actually start shifting things. Um, But on a foundation of, you know, a kind of a collaborative internal relationship between us and all of those different parts and pieces that we are comprised of. So self-compassion is absolutely essential to any of this work. Um, And the more that you try and solve your anxiety or solve your fear in the sense of making it go away and making yourself wrong for feeling it, I promise you that it won't work and that it will actually make things worse. It's like pouring more fuel on the fire rather than, you know, gently approaching that fire and going, okay, what's going on here and and what do I need? Um, So self-compassion is a must in any positive relationship with yourself rather than beating yourself up, rather than shaming yourself. Try leading with compassion and curiosity. And as a side note, the more we do that to ourselves, the more we can offer that to ourselves the greater our capacity to naturally offer that to others uh, because we're less likely to project that same you know, rigid expectation or you know unrealistic, the less likely we are to project those same you know, harsh, rigid standards onto other people of perfectionism of, well, you should just be better or do better or try harder uh, and you know not having a lot of time or patience for the things that people are struggling with. Uh, So I think there's a really positive ripple effect there. Okay, the next pillar of a healthy relationship with self, which is the second week of the Secure Self challenge that I'm going to be running, is around self-care. Now, I know that when a lot of you hear self-care, you might have a bit of an eye roll around, you know, I think that self-care has been so commoditized in the past decade probably uh, and it feels like the domain of you know glossy magazines and highly produced Instagram content of you know having a towel wrapped around your head and like a lovely face mask and a bubble bath and all of all of the things um, but you know and while I'm, I'm all for a, a lovely bubble bath it's not really what I'm talking about here what I'm really talking about is how attuned and responsive are you to the rhythms and the needs and the capacity of your body and your being. That sounds a little bit esoteric. Let me expand. I think that you know, once upon a time when I was living a very different life to how I live now, uh, I pretty much just pushed through all the time. So if I was tired, I would have more coffee. If I had a headache, I would take, you know, painkillers and keep pushing. If I had a cold, I would, again, like just take something to dull the symptoms so that I could plow on with whatever I was doing because all of those things in my body were inconvenient um, and were getting in the way of my agenda, which was just to do what I had to do. When I look back on that now, I can see how disconnected I was from my body uh, and the needs of my body and the rhythms of my body and how detrimental that was ultimately um, because it also meant that I was disconnected from the emotions of my body and you know to what I was just talking about around self-compassion when we treat all of those signals and and feedback that we're getting from our body as kind of inconvenient (laughs) and getting in the way of what we would prefer or desire or or what we want to do. And we just try and make it all go away, stuff it down. (laughs) Uh, That tends not to work and it tends to really come back to bite us with with a vengeance. So when I'm talking about self-care here, it's really, can I become more attuned to myself? I think even the fact that this might sound kind of woo-woo and esoteric to many of you speaks to how deeply disconnected we are collectively from our bodies and from 
our, you know, that, that we all kind of walk around on autopilot in this mode of busyness and to-do lists and hustle and, you know, how that really reliably leads us to feel burnt out and not only disconnected from ourselves, but disconnected from other people, chronically tired, chronically sick. And I think that it's really hard to have a positive relationship with yourself when you are living like that, because you are fundamentally It's kind of like your head is cut off from your body Uh, and understanding the role of the body in our emotional experience is so fundamental to my, not only my work, but the way that I live my life. And it's been a huge shift that I've made in the past five years or so and has had a really profound impact on my well-being and the way that I now live my life. Uh, So I think that the more that we can consciously train ourselves to check in on what do I need? How am I feeling? What is my capacity? How can I resource myself today to feel more grounded, more present, more energized? Uh, you know, do I need to take things slower or do I have more energy? Do I need to move my body? Uh, all of these things that when we, as I said, train ourselves to attune to that and turn towards that and check in with ourselves regularly, then that really feeds into this broader relationship of self-awareness. And we then kind of indirectly build more self-trust because we know that we're a really good caretaker of ourselves. Whereas when we ignore all of that and we just plow through and we bulldoze and we push on and we hustle, then we don't have much of a relationship of self-trust because we don't, we know that like we're not very responsible carers, right? Uh, In the same way as if you were responsible for caring for someone else and you consistently ignored the signals and needs that they had, and it was making them chronically sick, tired, and burnt out, then they probably wouldn't rely on you as someone who was going to be responsive and attuned to them in a way that cultivated trust and safety. So recognizing that you have that same responsibility to yourself to build up that relationship uh, and that it reaps so many rewards beyond just feeling better. You know, it's not just about having a picture perfect kind of self-care routine. That's again, not what I'm talking about. Uh, It's just this moment to moment practice of pausing and tuning in and going, how am I feeling? What do I need? Uh, You know, practically speaking, and again, this might sound kind of weird or or self-indulgent to you if this is not where you're coming from or not where you're at. Um, But many, many times throughout the day, every single day, I will pause and I'll check in with how I'm going. And it's not some big elaborate thing. It's just habit by this point. But I'll then seek to most optimize my environment um, and my surroundings and, you know, kind of optimize the moment. So I might go, ah, what do I need? I'm feeling a little bit restless. Do I need to walk outside for a few minutes? Or do I need to eat something? What do I feel like eating? Do I need to drink something? What do I feel like drinking? Uh, And actually pausing and inquiring and responding to specifically what I am feeling and needing in that moment and offering that to myself rather than, again, just plowing through on autopilot um, and doing things because I don't have time to think about it and I don't have the luxury of space, like all of that stuff. I think that the more we tell ourselves that story of, you know, I can't and I don't have time and, you know, all of that is really just taking us further away from ourselves when the goal is to bring us closer into alignment and wholeness. So self-care as a practice of turning towards ourselves and becoming more present to what is here today uh, and how we can bring more nourishment and groundedness to that uh, is a really, really valuable practice in nurturing your overall relationship with yourself. Okay, so the third pillar of self that I want to speak about is self-respect. And I am really, really bullish on self-respect as a fundamental building block of an overall healthy relationship with self. So this is particularly one that I think, you know, if the self-love stuff doesn't land for you, uh, focus on self-respect. If you want to build self-worth, focus on self-respect. I say this as someone who for many, many years, and I only realized this in hindsight, I had a pretty shocking relationship of self-respect. It was a pretty barren environment in that regard. And, you know, what this looked like for me was I didn't really know what my values were. I didn't really like myself very much. I relied a lot on external validation and wanting to be liked 
uh, wanting people to see me in a certain way. And so I just acted in ways and did things that for whatever reason, like gave me some hit of feeling temporarily good about myself. Um, but very often left me with this residue of anxiety or discomfort or, yeah, just not, not feeling good about you know, how I was acting, who I was being. Um, and I think there was just, there was no internal foundation of knowing who I was or knowing what my values were. And that really easily and reliably led me off track and led me astray. I really suffered as a result of that because I really didn't like myself. <laughs> and I can see now in hindsight how clearly that came from a lack of self-respect. So I believe deeply that building your self-respect is one of the best things that you can do. And you know, arguably, if you take nothing else away from this episode, think about self-respect, think about, you know, do I have self-respect? Or, you know, if I don't, why not? Like what leads me to feel a lack of self-respect? Um, because I think that that's really deeply important. Um, and it's something that while we may not think about it very much, I think a lot of people, if they were to reflect and introspect on it, they'd probably find that, yeah, that is a missing piece uh, in my relationship with myself is I don't have a lot of self-respect. Um, so, you know, how do we go about building that? I've spoken about this as well before. I think getting really clear on your values and then doing a bit of an audit going, okay, where am I not stacking up? Where am I out of alignment? Um, and trying to close the gap there is a really useful and kind of practical first step. I also think that, you know, challenging yourself. So self-discipline, I think is closely related to self-respect. It's almost like a sub bullet underneath self-respect, you know, following through on the things that you say you're going to do and actually challenging yourself, doing hard things rather than, you know, staying in a very small comfort zone and listening to those stories that tell you that you can't do certain things or that, you know, that's too hard or I'm not that kind of person. Really like, push those stories and go, oh, if that's the kind of person I want to be, then what's stopping me? Uh, and if it's just a matter of you showing up and doing something hard and continuing to show up and you know, maybe being bad at something to begin with, but then getting better, uh, I don't think there's you know, <laughs> many more powerful ways to build self-respect than through self-discipline. So, and again, that's something that has been relatively new to my life. I don't think I've always been self-disciplined, but certainly in the last five years or so, that's something that I've really embraced and that I now see as such a gift to myself rather than, you know, some punishment that I'm imposing upon myself. So learn to embrace hard things, learn to embrace challenge and grow through challenge and discomfort uh, and, you know, self-respect will flow as a natural consequence from that. And I think you'll really um, notice a shift in your overall relationship with yourself. Okay. Last but not least is self-trust. So again, you know, I could easily talk for a very long time about self-trust or any of these other pillars. Um, but just to give you a bit of a feel, you know, why is self-trust so important to our relationship with ourselves? Uh, I think in the absence of self-trust, it's very, very hard to not only trust in others, but I would argue more importantly, uh, it's very hard to trust in our own resilience. And for me, this is really the kernel of self-trust that is the most rewarding is, and again, I'll speak from personal experience. I think in cultivating a relationship of self-trust within myself, I feel a level of peace around whatever might happen in my life. That's a big statement, but it's one that I do attribute to having a pretty solid foundation of self-trust. It's this sense of, I know that a lot of things aren't within my control, but I trust in my ability to navigate what life throws at me. And so I can be decisive and I can back myself and I can take steps in the direction of what I value, what I hope for, and um, what is important to me, while also surrendering to, you know, the unknown and the uncertainty and knowing that like a lot of stuff is you know, not guaranteed. I can't guarantee that my relationship's going to work out. I can't guarantee that you know, anything in my work or my business is going to go the way that I would hope or plan. Um, but all of that being said and being true, I also trust that you know, if and when something unexpected or something disappointing or something challenging arises, um, that I will have the tools and the resources and the support to deal with it. Um, and so I think that 
having that kind of internal environment makes you not only more courageous, um, but far more resilient and and much more at peace um, because you're not living in constant fear or anticipation of everything bad that could happen and trying desperately and wasting so much energy trying to prevent something bad from happening. Um, Because I think a lot of us, particularly those who struggle with anxiety, do just end up spinning your wheels and expending so much energy uh, on playing out every possible worst case scenario and then reverse engineering to try and prevent that from ever happening uh, to this point where your whole life becomes about the thing that you don't want rather than you know, pursuing the things that you do want with you know, presence and confidence and, and optimism. So self-trust is so essential. Um, And I think, again, it's all of these pillars of self that I've spoken about in today's episode. I think they feed off each other and they reinforce each other. So the more self-respect you build, the more self-trust you'll have. Uh, The more you have a really caring and attuned relationship with yourself, the more self-trust you'll have. Um, And the more self-trust you have, the more you're going to do those other things as well, um, because they all fit together really neatly like puzzle pieces. And as you start to change the internal environment in one way, uh, some of those older patterns around hustle and burnout and ignoring boundaries and approval seeking and people pleasing and not doing things that aren't comfortable for you just to make everyone else happy, those behaviors stop feeling compatible with the new internal environment that you're building. Uh, And so you get this sort of full system upgrade uh, as you start, you know, sowing the seeds of a healthier relationship with self. Some of those old behaviors that have felt like a fit in your current inner world um, may naturally just fall away as they stop being a match for where you're at um, and the kind of relationship that you're really cultivating with yourself. So I hope that this has been helpful in, I suppose, broadening out the lens if you've ever felt a little discouraged by self-love advice (laughs) or even you've heard about the importance of building self-worth but you haven't really known like where to start or what that means or what that looks like hopefully breaking it down a level further into these subcategories or these pillars um, starts to crystallize what you can do. And as I said, I like these pillars because I think they do translate more tangibly into day-to-day practices uh, and you know, things that we can be consciously choosing, um, kind of putting runs on the board every day. And it doesn't have to be big dramatic things. It's just, you know, one step at a time, one day at a time. But with the passage of time, you can look back and realize that you've made really profound changes in the direction of who you want to be and how you want to live your life. And that is very rewarding work. So I hope that this has been helpful. As I said, if you've enjoyed today's episode and you want to join us in the Secure Self Challenge, where we dive into each of these themes over four weeks, Uh, I would love to see you in there. Um, You've got about five days left to join before we kick off next week with our opening call. Uh, I'd love to see you there. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks, guys.